And here we are coming to you live from our top secret broadcasting compound in Bunkerville, Nevada. This is Pastor Mike, and I'm online, and I am live with you today, and I am stirred up. First of all, because I got an email, um, and this was pretty exciting. Uh, I've got to share this one with you because my ship may have just come in, and I'm going to share this with you. Um, According to the email that I received, let me show you the picture of the guy. See? See that guy right there? According to the email that I received, I just won the Kenyan lottery. Now, this email comes from an African prince. This guy right here. I just won the Kenyan lottery, and it's worth a million dollars. And all I have to do is send him my bank account number so that he can transfer the money. And I'm kind of excited about this, all right? Then, right after that, I'm, I'm just fixing to send him my bank account number because I that million dollars, I won, fair and square. Then I got another email right after that. This one also from an African prince. In fact, he's a Kenyan prince. He wants to give me free health care for life. All I have to do is give him all of my bank account numbers, my social security number, my confidential health information so he can make it happen. This is the uh, African Kenyan prince that I just won from. That deserves a... There we go. I couldn't pass that one up. Uh, today is... Earth Day. Big deal. Uh, what is Earth Day? It's when everybody worships the wrong God. It's what they're doing. And it is. It is all about Earth worship, which is Gaia worship, which is Ashtaroth worship, which is Diana, whom the whole world worshipeth, the book of Acts says, just by a different name. She is Diana, she is Venus, Ashtaroth, she is um, Gaia, uh, or, or shouldn't that be Gurla instead of Gaia? It, it, I don't understand it. Anyway, um, it's Earth Day today, and uh, I, I am not celebrating Earth Day today. I'm going to hold it until the new Earth comes along, and then you're going to hear me shout when that takes place. You don't know what I'm talking about? Read Isaiah 66. Read Revelation chapters 20, 21, 22. You'll find all about the new heaven and the new earth that God is going to create, because God does everything twice. Have you ever noticed that? I mean, just stop and think about this. Uh, God speak, Job said, God speaketh once, yea, twice, in a dream or a vision. David said, once have I heard this twice. I've heard it twice. Pharaoh, when he was giving the dream interpret, or excuse me, not Pharaoh, <laughs> Joseph, when he was given the dream interpretation to Pharaoh, he said, because that the dream is doubled unto thee twice, it's because it's of the Lord. And what God does, he does it twice. So I've had one birth already. I've already fulfilled the first birth, born of water. I am awaiting my second birth, born of spirit. Looking forward to that one. We have Christ coming the first time. That's God speaketh once. Christ coming the second time. That's God speaketh twice. He does it that way, and he's consistent about it. So if I were to say to you, I believe that we have this earth and then the new earth after that one, and then we're going to have a, another one after that one. Would you believe me? What? I can't hear you. You wouldn't believe that, would you? Why, why wouldn't you believe that? And ask yourself the question, why would I not believe, like 
Hoggard said. Hoggard said there's this earth and the one coming after that, and then there's a third one that he knows about. Why do not why do you not believe that? Because it's not in the Bible. Bingo. It's not in the Bible. If you pretend that you see it there, you would be surprised at the number of people who would believe you. If you said, I believe there's like three earths, you would, you and, and taught it, and then read some verses that said nothing about it whatsoever, but you did it with an authoritative voice. Um, who was it? Brother um, La Follette, the other day they were visiting us, and he said, he was, we was talking about the deceptions that are going on. He said, he said, Pastor Mike, he said, you stand there and you have a voice of authority. And he said, people will just believe what you say simply because you're standing up there. And I said, Gary, I know it. I don't want that. I want the word of God. I want people to follow and believe every word of God is pure. And it is pure. And you don't need anything else. So if I told you that there were three earths, would you believe it? The answer is no, you should not believe that. So what's the difference between if I say there's this earth, there's the one in Revelation 21, 22, Isaiah 66, and then there's going to be a third one after that. What's the difference then if someone says, well, I believe there was an earth before Genesis 1, 2, and then there's this one now, and then there's going to be one after that. How many does that make? Three earths. That's not in the Bible. It's not God's method. It's not God's order. It doesn't match anything that God has ever done in the scriptures. It's not there. First coming, second coming. First birth, second birth. First earth, second earth. First heaven, new heaven. Born once, born twice. That's God's, and the, the, that earth that they talk about before, and I, I got something I'm going to read to you from a book that pretends to be a Bible, and I am, I am pretty stirred up today. A book that pretends to be the Bible will, will try to make you believe that there will be or are three earths, and I'm not buying it. I don't believe it. You have to do a lot of monkey business with the Bible in order to spew that one out, and that's what people are doing. But it's Earth Day. I'm going to celebrate by buying lots of fast food and throwing the empty containers in the trash. That's what I'm going to do. Not really. I don't think I'm going to do that. My wife is probably cooking supper for me. Anyway, uh, what's got me so stirred up today? I tweeted this. Uh, there are actually two articles. Several of you came. By the way, there's, there's something else stirring me up today. If you were just looking for a fast ticket to hell, I mean, if you were just going, you know what? I'm just, you know, I've had all the fun I'm going to have. Let's just go to hell today, all right? Let's just get it over with and get, get this thing started, this, you know, burning eternity for, you know, in hell fire. Let's just get this going. If there was a way that you could do that, this would probably be the way that it's done. Somebody made up, if you, don't, if you don't know, I think it was uh, Sunday. These wacko, crazy head pot smokers in Colorado were celebrating openly with marijuana joints. Somebody decided that they had not done enough to deserve hell, and so they decided to do this. They made a picture of Jesus with a joint and a hamburger in his hand. And Jesus says, when I get back, all I want is the burger of the gods. That is, let's see here. And uh, let's see here. What else? What else can I play here? That's what that is. Or that's who that is. That's who that is that made that. 
Um, I, I, that that just, mm. you and, and you know what really bugs me about it? Jesus never said that. He never said those words. Now, yeah, I'm in, I'm inflamed over the marijuana joint in his fingers. Not so much the burger because I'm sure Jesus ate bread and meat together. Um, when I was in Kenya, they were they were cooking a meal one time, and it was some beef um, that had been uh, sort of like in a stew with a really rich sort of, um, I can't describe the sauce that it was in, but it was very savory. And they were making the, the flatbreads that they make in Kenya, and they have a lot of coleslaw there, and they served it, and you're you know supposed to eat it. You eat the beef, then the little coleslaw, and then eat the bread. And I got to looking at it, and I'm going, hang on. Let me Americanize this. Let me show you how we do this in America. And I picked up the flatbread, and I put the meat in there, and then I put the coleslaw on top of it, and I rolled it up like that, and I said, this is America. <laughs> it was delicious. So I'm not too upset about Jesus eating the hamburger. Uh, but the marijuana joint and the words that Jesus did not say, uh, fellow, whoever came up with this little thing, that's going to come back around and kick you in the rear end. I'm reasonably sure it's going to. And if I were you, I would get, as the old timers say, paid up and prayed up. If I were you and I were smart, which apparently you're not for making this. You're, apparently you have no fear of God whatsoever. I do. I don't make pictures like this. I don't make jokes about Jesus. In fact, I'll be honest with you, years, years ago, way back years ago, um, I used to sit up late on Saturday and watch Saturday Night Live. I just like, I mean, I like comedy. I like a good joke. This is back years ago. And um, I don't know who was doing their writing at this particular time, but there, they, it just seemed like every other episode, they were mocking Jesus Christ. Now, I got to get up the next morning and go to church. So I'm watching this, and here comes, they're doing a skit with Jesus in it. Um, it was done by uh, Phil Hartman, who was killed not too long after that. Think about that. Phil Hartman comes out as Jesus, and he's trying to go see the, the president of NBC or something like that. And, and um, oh, I can't remember the guy's name. Anyway, he was playing this little snotty male secretary. And Jesus comes in, the secretary says, well, isn't that nice? Why don't you have a seat? Of course, Jesus is ticked off over that. And I'm watching that, and the Holy Ghost is going, going to church tomorrow? Yeah. Bible? Yeah. Who are you going to worship? Jesus. Is he your Savior? Yeah. Doesn't that make you mad? And I wanted to say, yeah, but it's funny. And then it, I'm just going, what are you doing, Hoggard? What are you doing? They're making fun of your Savior. They're making fun of the one who died for your sins and your transgressions. And since you have loads of them, I don't think I would watch this anymore. And I, I have not watched it since. I've not watched it. I don't. I, that, that just upset me, and I'm not going to watch it. And I, you can say, well, oh, you got to see this. It was funny. No, they crossed a line. Uh, anyway, talking about crossing a line. Here's a couple articles that you shared with me. One of them uh, we're going to deal with, and we're going to actually deal with both of these, and I'm going to show you from the Scriptures, as I like to do, what's going on in this world. Here is the first article. Uh, clone To clone or not to clone, scientists create human from stem cells. Advanced cell technology. You know what? I'm going to talk. I'm, I Actually, I'm not going to talk. I'm not going to do this very well. I'm going to go to the website at www.advanced. Let's see here if I can see it. Advanced cell, C-E-L-L, -L, advanced cell.com. Let's, let's go to their website. Oh, you know, it's funny that in the old days, in the 90s, you had to type in www, and now they don't make you type that in anymore, so they don't need it. 
But I guarantee you, if you type in WW, they're going to spit it back out saying, we don't know what you're talking about. So let me change it. www.advancedcell.com. Let's see what's on their website. Uh, Advanced Cell Technology. What is that little ACT? Act. Ah, I get it. Act. In other words, the actions of humans is what's going to create this. Let me read the article. Advanced Cell Technology, a privately funded biotech corporation. Who funds it? Ask yourself the question, who funds this? Where does it get its money from? Has reported a successful cloning of male human cells from samples from a 35-year-old and a 75-year-old. 35-year-old and 75-year-old what? I, I, would, I would assume human. But what gender? It looks to me like that this is two men and using their DNA. The 35-year-old, a cloning of male human cells from samples from a 35-year-old male and 75-year-old, and now have used DNA from infants to drive home the point that humans can be easily cloned, easily cloned. These samples were injected into a human egg that was, quote, stripped of its DNA. You're not supposed to do that. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you why in a minute. Robert Lanza, lead author of Senior Chief Scientist at the ACT, said, There are many diseases, whether it's diabetes, I have diabetes, I don't want you messing with my genes. They fit perfectly. Don't mess with them. Alzheimer's or Parkinson's disease that usually increase with age. Isn't it interesting that to justify what they're doing, they pull out all of these bad diseases that slowly kill somebody, like Alzheimer's. I've lost a grandmother. I, have lo I am in the process of losing an aunt and a woman in our church who I hold dear is in a nursing home right now suffering and dying from Alzheimer's. There are many diseases, whether it's diabetes, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's disease, that usually increase with age. Lanza and Young Guy Chung from the CHA Stem Cell Institute in Korea. Now you can Google the symbol and the flag of Korea. You're going to see something there. Korea combined forces to develop therapies based on the research. The researchers took DNA from skin cells donated from middle-aged men and two men, two men now making a baby, injected those samples in fertile eggs provided by four women. But here's what they did. They took the fertile eggs. If you, if you know anything about the birds and the bees... You, you may know about the outer portion, but here's the inner portion. In the egg, the egg has 23 chromosomes from mommy. The seed has 23 chromosomes from the daddy. And when you read Genesis 2, Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they two shall be one flesh, 46 words there exactly, because the two coming together make one flesh. God's, listen, that's not some metaphor either. He meant exactly what he said. 23 here and 23 here, going to jump in there together, and they're going to make 46. But now, now they took and stripped the 23 chromosomes, the DNA, out of the woman's egg and just left this hollow cup waiting to be filled. So what did they fill it with? They took two men, took their stem cells, mingled them all together, put them in a little thing where they spin them around and around and around and around, around. The kid's probably going to be born dizzy. Put that in. In fact, let me show you the graphic here. Let me, let me, uh, let me pull that up here. Let me show you what they did here. This is what they did. They took Bob's skin cells. Here we have the egg, and they took out the egg's DNA. Not supposed to do that. Then they inserted 
Bob's DNA into empty donor egg. And they got the embryo to grow. And they say this part has been tricky until now. So probably pretty soon on TV, you're going to see the Ronco stem cell baby machine. Yours for only six easy payments of $6.3 million over the next six months. Then they're going to use Bob's stem cells to make new therapies for Bob. See, it's all about Bob. It's all about saving Bob's life. I'm not making this up. I swear to Bob that that's what this is all about. But that's what they're doing right now. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to illustrate to you from the Scripture what is so massively wrong with this. Do you, do you know that the Bible that you and I have is a book of present truth? I started teaching on Woden's Day night. Started it last Woden's Day. Um, I'm going to pick it up again tomorrow night. How to, how to read, believe, and understand the Bible. And it's just simple, very, very simple things that you can do. And one of them is you understand that the Bible was for them back then. It is for us now, and it is for whoever in the future. It, that's the miracle and the beauty of the Bible. One Bible, one set of words, Genesis to Revelation. There's truth all throughout the entire Bible, present truth for us right now. Do you think that God sitting up in heaven is going, what, what, are, they, what are they doing? Hey, stop that. You can't take that out of there. Stop it. Oh, my. What are they doing down there? How come I didn't see that coming? That's not God. That's not God. He saw it. He wrote about it. He, he, he said in the scriptures, don't be doing that. That's wrong. You cannot see that stuff in that egg. I put that in there. Don't take it out. If you take that out, I want to take a rod. I'll, oh, I'll show you the scriptures in a little bit, what God said he was going to do when they took it out. And I'm, I'm, you're going to, I'm, I'm stirred up because not only do they take it out of the human's DNA, they take it out of the church's DNA. So now we're able to clone, able to take two guys, three guys, 12 guys, however many you want just a, a, a borgish mord of guys all lined up, getting their DNA, put it in the, in the kettle, mix it all up real good, and then start making babies with it. No women required. We don't have laws for that. We don't have, we, we cannot even fathom the dangers that we're going to get into in this world from doing that. Every I have never I have never seen the cl the clone movie where everybody gets along and they all live happily ever after. Never seen that movie. In fact, there's one let me um, let me pull this graphic up here. I've got it in the queue. Let's see here. Here it is. Uh, somebody sent me an email and I can't find it, but he said, Pastor Mike, here is a, a movie that's out, or they, they see this movie, and it's about cloning human beings. And he said, just, you know, kind of take a gander at the graphics that they use here. I get it. Six, 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 everything sixes. I get it. I understand it. I've never seen the movie where they cloned somebody and they all lived happily ever after. Here is a brand, this is a brand new story. This was, uh, this made it on Drudge Report. Uh, this is uh, from the independent.co.uk revealed. See, I, I'm telling you, the genetic scientists 
probably already have the spliced creature. You remember that movie from Spliced? Mixing the animal with the human? They probably already have that. They're not going to tell you because it's so morbid and so grotesque that it would just, I don't know. Of course, I don't know nowadays. I think the more we hear, the more we're becoming desensitized to this issue. And the idea of cloning and mixing DNA and everything like that, I don't think, it, I don't think it's going to bother people the way it would bother people back in the 1950s or the 60s and the 70s when they see these cloning movies and, these, and uh, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde and the Island of Dr. Moreau movies. I mean, think about it. When uh, Boris Karloff first starred as Frankenstein's monster back in the 30s, it was running people out of theaters. Boris, of course, Boris Karloff was an amazing actor. And I used to read about, I used to read about how they made these movies, how they used layers of cheesecloth on his head to get his head like that. And they would put real heavy things on his eyelids to make his eyes look like they were like he was sleepy all the time. And just amazing what they did. But that movie, Frankenstein, scared people so bad they run out of theaters. They were scared so bad at Frankenstein's Monster in the 1930s. And we watch that now and going, that is so hokey. Gosh, that's a, ooh, I'm scared. Ooh. Okay. We don't do that anymore. Why? Because we've seen Alien. We've seen the little alien monster jump out of this guy's chest cavity. We've seen that. It's Frankenstein. That's no big deal. A new story. But I, I'm telling you, they, they probably have far greater advancements in these laboratories than you and I know about. So here's the article revealed. Scientists, quote, unquote, edit DNA. Here we go to correct adult genes and cure diseases. Now, I want you to fathom this for a minute. The way this article reads, they think, you know, if a child is conceived, uh, or maybe before a child is conceived, if we could intervene and then pre-select the DNA that we want that child to have and then put it in the woman's egg, and then, then that child, from its very conception, will not have all these diseases in them. But the very first time, I think it was uh, maybe 2004, 2005, somewhere around in there, that I um, did the video, The Secret of Solomon's Key Revealed, with the Club O Prophecy. Um. I had speculated that they would they would come up with a way, probably by way of stem cells, to they would alter, they would have these genetically altered DNA strands, and they would figure out how to insert that into somebody to alter them even while they're an adult. Pastor Alo was up here a while ago before, and I was just starting to do the research. And I said, you ought to see what I'm studying today. He said, what? Although he said it in a Kenyan accent. And um, I, I said, they're, they're able now to, to edit people's DNA. I said, it's like I'm white and you're black. There's the big elephant in the room nobody's paying attention to. But anyway, I said, I'm white and you're black. And, and I said, that's the difference in our DNA. And I said, they're now telling us that they know how to alter the DNA. And he said, to make, to make a black man white? And I went, could be done. Because, but I speculated on this, and I'm not saying I'm big, some big forecaster. I'm just, I'm just going, I think this is the logical conclusion here. That at some point they're going to be able to insert something into the human that is going to start work on editing his live current DNA as it stands right now so that in a span of time his whole body then becomes and mirrors the DNA that was inserted into him. And now it's been revealed 
that that technology is for real. Let me read this to you. A genetic disease has been cured. Here we go. Are you listening to that? Oh, how terrible it is that... Let me turn my heating pad on here. It's a bad day, man. Need heat. Um, oh, he's got some disease. Oh, he's going to die. Oh, do you, do you remember... Do you remember if you saw the newest Star Trek movie, Into the Darkness? It starts out with Khan, although you don't know it's Khan. That movie took me completely by surprise. I'm just going, that's Khan. Here Khan shows up at the beginning of the film, and there's a guy who works for Starfleet, and he has access to something that Khan wants, but this guy's child is dying. And the doctors can't do anything for This is the 23rd century. Can't do anything for And so Khan shows up to this guy and says, I can cure her. She doesn't have to die. And you find out that it's, here we go. Are you ready? It's Khan's blood that cures her. Because in this one, this is like a, a remake of Star Trek II. In Star Trek II, Spock dies, the alien hybrid and he's raised back from the dead again. And this one, Kirk dies. And Bones says, get away from me, Spock. Let me save his life. And so Bones inserts him with Khan's blood, and Kirk comes back to life. And there's a number. There is a number in this movie that when I saw it, I went, oh. and I'm going to show it to you. In an upcoming Watchmen broadcast, get ready. This um, series on the seal, the secret of the seal, uh, I fantasized in my mind that it was going to be four DVDs. I'm thinking, I don't know, 10, something like that. Anyway, uh, genetic, a genetic disease has been cured in living adult animals for the first time using a revolutionary. Think of all the things that you're seeing on the Internet and in the church saying there's going to be a revolution, a revolution, a revolution. We're going to have a revolution. And the word ev evil, E-V-O-L, or they use the word revolve as revolution, and the word evolve is in that word. Just, just Google that. Do an image search on Google and look at the word revolve or revolution. Revolution church, revolution Bible study, revolution. Oh, it's all about a revolution. Using a revolutionary genome editing technique that can make the smallest changes to the vast database of the DNA molecule with pinpoint accuracy. Scientists have used the genome editing technology to cure adult laboratory mice of an inherited liver disease by correcting a single letter. Isn't it interesting that genetic scientists discovered that DNA was coded with letters, just like in a book, and how many letters 22. Go read Psalm 119. Psalm 119. There are 22 sections to Psalm 119 in your King James Bible, and every one of them will start out with an, a Hebrew letter. Aleph, Bet, Daleth, Gimel. That's the only, it's the only ones I remember. By correcting a single letter of the genetic alphabet, which had been mutated in a vital gene involved in liver metabolism. A similar mutation in the same gene causes the equivalent inherited liver disease in humans. And the successful repair of the genetic defect in laboratory mice raises hopes that the first clinical trials on patients could begin within a few years, scientists said. Now, I want you to get a hold of this. It said in a few years. I think they're already doing it. No doubt. There is no doubt in my mind. Did you know, did, were you aware that they were doing this before the article came out? No, we weren't aware of it, but they were doing it. I believe it's already been being done. Pardon my French. It's already happening. They're just going to ease into it. Now, the, the idea here of a few years, we don't know how long that's going to be. 
but there is something about this. The question was asked me a, a, a while back, Pastor Mike, if they start cloning people, do you think these people will have souls? At first, I said, well, technically, twins like Brady and Bradley Crumb, they are cloned individuals. One, they are, they are identical twins. They were both born at the same time. And I mean, for years, I couldn't tell them apart. Um, and when they're babies, you can't. I mean, people who have twins as babies, they, you know, they sometimes will dress them in a certain way so they know. And I think, um, I think Brady's mom dressed him in pants and, and dressed Bradley in a dress or something. No, I'm just, I made that up. But you can't tell them apart because they are cloned individuals. And they have souls. I know they have souls. So I thought then that these cloned babies, it was possible for them to have souls. I don't think so anymore. And I'm going to give you biblical reasons why I don't think so anymore. Um, the success is the latest achievement in the field of genome editing. This has been transformed by the discovery of CRISPR. C-R-I-S-P-R, -R. we talked about that before, technology that allows scientists to make almost any DNA changes at precisely defined points on the chromosomes of animals or plants. CRISPR was initially discovered in 1987 as an immune defense used by bacteria against invading viruses. Its powerful genome editing potential in higher animals, including humans, was only fully realized in 2012 and 2013 when scientists... Uh, showed that it can be combined with a DNA sniping enzyme called CAS9 and used to edit human genomes. Now, let me show you the graphic of the, the science behind crisping, all right? Here's what they do. Here's the CRISPR. You have the diseased liver. You use an RNA guide molecule. Um, think of a messenger. RNA acts as, it's called messenger RNA. What is the word for messenger in Greek? Angelos, angels. Hang on. So the molecule is programmed to match the FAH gene carrying the point mutation G to A. In other words, guanine and adenine. A special enzyme called CAS9 is attached to the RNA guide. Its job is to find the target sequence of DNA and repair the fault, the error. There is an error right here. We're going to change that error. We're going to make it better. The RNA aligns with the target DNA sequence and the CA, CAS9 or CA59, I, I can't see that attaches and cuts both strands of the DNA double helix. The mutation is corrected by substituting an A for a G in the FAH gene. They, they correct, we're going we're gonna to correct it. There is, a, there is an error in the genome, in the sequence, and we are going to make it all better. Uh, since then, here's the article again. Since then, there has been an explosion. I have one of those. Hang on. That was, uh, that was an explosion of interest in technology because it's such a simple method of changing the individual letters of the human genome. The three billion base pairs of the DNA molecule with an accurate, listen, listen how they talk, with an accuracy equivalent to correcting a single misspelt word in, word in a 23-volume encyclopedia. 23 in the latest study, scientists at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology used CRISPR to locate and correct the single mutated DNA base pair in a liver gene known as FAH, which can lead to a fatal buildup of the amino acid tyrosine in humans and has to be treated with drugs and a special diet. The research has effectively cured mice suffering from the disease by altering the genetic makeup of about a third of their liver cells using the CRISPR technique, which was delivered by high-pressure intravenous injections. Now, something I'm going to throw in here that I don't have an answer for yet. It's interesting to me 
that they're using mice, and I understand that mice DNA is, or mice metabolism is somewhat similar to our human metabolism and how the body functions and things like that. Uh, that ought to make you little rodents think twice about killing them things. They're related to us somehow, some way. And, um, but it's interesting, they keep using mice to do this because there is a story in the King James Version of the Bible. The five lords of the Philistines steal the Ark of the Covenant, which has the DNA in it. It has the two tables of stone inside of it. They steal it. And when it plagues all of them, they have, the, the King James uses the word emirads. It's That word is related to hemorrhoids. Okay? And maybe or maybe not like hemorrhoids, but it was a hemorrhagic boil of some kind. In other words, hema means blood. They had these blood boils and blisters all over, and it's killing them. And so they sent back the Ark of the Covenant. Go read this. It's weird. They sent back the Ark of the Covenant with a present, five golden mice and five golden hemorrhoids what they sent back, okay, and a prescription for hemorrhoid medicine. They sent that back to the Israelites. They said, we can't have this. It's killing us. I don't know the connection, but I think there is. I think there is a connection here. Um, let's see here. Professor Daniel Anderson of MIT, who led the study, we basically showed you could use the CRISPR system in an animal to cure a genetic disease, and the one we picked was a disease in the liver, which is very similar to one found in humans. The disease is caused by a single-point mutation, and we showed that the CRISPR system can be delivered in an adult animal and result in a cure. We think it's important proof of, princ of principle that this technology can be applied to animals to cure disease. We're the animals, by the way. Professor Anderson told The Independent, the fundamental advantage is that you are repairing the defect. You are actually correcting the DNA. You're correcting God's book. You're correcting God's word because you say it has errors in it. That's what you say. You, you say Hoggard is wrong. Because he says his Bible is perfect. It's not what I said. It's what God said. That's what you should be worried about. You get in a tizzy about what Mike Hoggard says. And Mike Hoggard was only reading what God said. God said his word was pure. He said that his seed was incorruptible. That means it doesn't have any mistakes. You just think it's a mistake, but it's not a mistake. And you stumbled over the stone of offense because you're disobedient to the word. That's why you did it. I'm going to, we're going to, we're going to open up a can on this one, a fresh can on this one. The doctor says what is exciting about this approach is that we can actually correct a defective gene in a living adult animal. That's a, I thought about this years ago, that they would have the ability to insert something that would alter genetically your entire being, and you would be transformed or changed. So... Write, write these words down. Evolution, revolution, revolve, change, transformation. Write those words down and then do a Google search, a Google image search, or just a Google web search of those words. You're going to see that it is everywhere. You're going to find products that are being called revolution. You're going to find products that are being called evolve, revolve. 
you're going to find products that are going to be all about transformation and change. You're going to find political ideas about transformation and change and revolutions. I don't know everything about the Bundy situation in Bunkerville, uh, Nevada, which is like right next door here. I don't know everything that's going on there. I don't see what's going on behind the scenes. But I, the, uh, I was reading some news this morning, looking at some of the headlines. There's a lot of people getting involved here at the Bundy Ranch. Is it possible that this situation is going to lead to a revolution? And I want you to think about something for a minute. And what I'm going to tell you is it's not meant to get you to just not take a side. Take a side. Choose a side. Choose whose side you're going to be on. But I want you to remember something. We have a Watchman video broadcast called um, um, Baphomet, the God of Transformation. I did that down in Harrison, Arkansas several years ago. We are going there again Thursday. There will not be a 12 p.m. live broadcast of Pastor Mike Online, but... If, if we can get everything to work, we're going to be streaming the, um, uh, the Bible conference, or the camp meetings, what they call it, the camp meeting live from Harrison, Arkansas. We're also going to record the sermons, and we'll make them available to you. But they would be, this, the live stream will be available if we get everything to work. I've got it all worked out in my head how we're going to do it. i just got to put it together and test it. And Michael's been coming up here saying, did you, Dad, did you bring the stuff? Oh! I forgot the stuff. Oh, no. So I better better do it tomorrow. Uh, but anyway, uh, we're going to be streaming that. So be watching that. And God has laid uh, a message on my heart. Um, I'm actually excited about preaching this one. So that'll be Saturday morning. Uh, I think Charlie Jameson starts at 9. And I'll tell you something. If you get a chance to listen to Brother Charlie Jameson, I love this man. I love him. I love his family. Uh, he is a he's a very good-hearted, godly. He's a sinner like I am, but he's a good good man. He loves the old book. He loves winning souls. He loves good, clean living, and uh, so he's going to be speaking before me. God's given him a wisdom that I don't have, and it's a wisdom that I I I need to hear from other preachers things that I don't naturally get. Um, but anyway, I preached a message called Baphomet, the God of Transformation, because it occurred to me, Baphomet has salve on one arm and coagula on the other. And the I, and he's the opposite. It's the, it's the thesis versus the antithesis. This is Hegelian dialect. Hegelian dialect is, is hinged right upon Baphomet. By the way, take a look, get out a dollar bill, get out, get out a dollar bill, look at the back of it, and then put it in an envelope, send it to me. No, I'm just, I'm just, uh, just a little uh, joke there. Uh, look on the back of it. The eagle on the back of that $1 bill, and I'm going to be dealing with this, has opposites in its claws. Did you ever notice that? You ever thought about that? It's got arrows in this one and an olive branch in this one. Arrows for war, and this one's for peace. Same body. That's like the double-headed eagle of masonry. But Baphomet is the god of transformation. And I think, I think that in order to bring about the new paradigm, the synthesis, you've got to get the thesis and the antithesis to clash together so you can bring about change. I don't know if this Bundy Ranch deal is going to do that. But I think it's coming. I absolutely think it's coming, so be watching for that. Let me, um, let, me, let me deal with this issue of transformation here in a little bit. All right? Think of verses. Think of verses. Let's, uh, let's get our can of King James here. Fresh can of King James. We're going to open it up, and we're going to turn it loose. All right? Turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 15. Now, I've got some verses that I'm going to put up on the screen here in a little bit, but I want you to open up your Bible or download the uh, purebiblesearch.com software free of charge. Install it on your Linux, Mac, 
and your Windows. I currently use it on my Windows machines and on my Linux machine. I am using, in case you're wondering, you Linux people out there, I'm right now I'm currently using, I, I go through Linux distros like some people have bodily functions, all right? Um, right now I'm using, um, what is it? What is it I'm using? Um, Zorn, something like that, Zorin. And uh, it's supposed to sort of act like Windows XP and, and things like that. And so I'm using that. And the Pure Bible Search software works amazing on that. And I love it. Um, but anyway, you can do that. You can open up 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We're teaching on this in Sunday school, chapter 15. It's only taken me like half a year. But anyway, we're learning things as we go on. He's telling us in verse, let's start in uh, verse 47. The first man is of the earth, earthy. The second man is the Lord from heaven. Do you see it? Do you see that God does one and two, but not one, two, three? If there's three earths, if there are three earths, there will be three births for humanity. There's not. Except a man, and, and the people, there, there are people out there who believe that you get saved and you sin once and, and that sin causes you to lose your salvation. You have to get saved over again. I don't, I don't believe that. I think that's bogus. I think that's goofy doctrine is what it is. And it's, not, it's not supported in the scriptures at all, period. It's not there. And the idea that you're going to have a second birth and then a third birth is blatantly unscriptural, and, and most of you know that. You know it's wrong. So what makes people think that the earth is going to have three births, three different earths? I don't know where they get it. Um, so that which is uh, of the earth is earthy. The second man is the Lord from heaven. Verse 48, as is, the, as is the earthy, such are they also that are earthy, and as is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Are you catching that? If you're corrupt, you're not going to heaven. You're not getting this new, wonderful, amazing body called the body of Christ. You're not getting that. You're going to get something else. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, that's when it's going to happen, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. I believe that there are going to be two transformations in this world. One of them is, of course, the transformation of God's people on this earth, both dead and alive, dead first, then alive, and we will be transformed, we will be changed, we will be translated from this body, this image, to the image of Christ. We're going to be transformed and changed. I believe that that transformation is coming. It has everything to do with the seed of transformation, being born again, not of incorruptible seed, but of, of not of corruptible seed, but by incorruptible seed, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. So I believe that the translation is the transformation of us from flesh to spirit, this brand new, beautiful body that God's going to give us. Hallelujah. Woo. I mean, let's get happy about it. All right. Woo. I believe that there is a antithesis to this, the devil's version of it. So when you see these words, change, transformation, revolution, evolution, evolve, revolve, the shift that's going to take place, when you see these words, I believe that they are speaking of the change in humanity that is going to take place. Let me give you a number associated with it. If you look back in 1 Corinthians 15, um, here's what he said. Behold, I show you a mystery. Here's the mystery. Number one, we shall not all sleep. Number two, but we shall all be changed. Number three, in a moment. Number four, in the twinkling of an eye. And number five, at the last trump. Isn't that neat? 
Go to 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17. Here's what the same pattern is replicated there. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God. The dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them. That's beautiful. But this number five is our conquering over death. Genesis 5 is all about death. The law, first five books of the Bible, it's all about death. Paul called it the law of sin and death. That is in sharp contrast to the law of liberty that James spoke about. It's not the same law. One brings death and one brings life. Now, think about this. Think of what Lucifer said in Isaiah 14. I will ascend, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Which is used that pentagram. And that pentagram is earth, air, fire, and water, and the fifth thing that rises up out of that when those four come together. And that number five, it, you can see it both in the biblical translation of God's people and the change that takes place, but you also see it in the earthly. Let's go back to the Philistines. How many lords were there? Five. How many mice did they send back? Five. How many hemorrhoids did they send back? Five. That number five is associated with the change, the transformation. So take that to Revelation chapter 9. What trumpet sounds? Trumpet number 5. The fifth trumpet sounds. The locusts come out of the earth. They, they inject people. They inject them with this miracle cure from the Holy Land. And for five months... Nobody dies. For five months on planet Earth, nobody on the whole planet dies. They want to, but nobody does. So I think there's a change coming. I think there's a trend. Think, think, of it, think of it like this. You're going to like this, all right? I put some thought into this today. Our transformation... You and I, because we believe the scriptures, we believe what it says. We don't say, now a better translation is that we don't do that. I'm gonna show you something in a minute. When we change, or when we are changed, we go up, we rise to the skies. We shall rise, we shall rise. Hallelujah. That's what's gonna happen with us. When the world transforms, they're going to fall. Think about what Paul said to watch for. Think about what Paul told us to look for before that day happens. He said, brethren, I beseech you, by the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering. Let me, I'm going to turn there just to make sure I don't say it wrong. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. That's our transformation, our change. That you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us. Oh, let's, let's count. Verse 2. That you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, Neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter as from us. Is that the day of Christ is at hand. Isn't that neat? One, two, three, four, five. Unless you're a giant and like, I don't know how they do that. Look, I'm a giant. Let no man deceive you by any ism. I'm going to, some, someday I'm going to make a video and call it, the Holy Scriptures without the ism. Because isms have a tendency to ruin the Bible, don't they? Most of you came out of an ism. Whatever it was, you came out of an ism, like Catholicism. You came out of that. Buddhism. Okay? You came out of an ism 
because you didn't like things messing with your Bible. You did the right thing. The isms are all in the camp. So come out of the camp, all right? Come out of, come out of the city. Come out of there. Um, that day shall not come. What day? What day, Paul? The coming of our Lord and our gathering together unto him. And see, some people don't like that. Some people don't like that it says that because their ism says something different. So what they do is that they, uh, they play these little monkey games with Scripture so that then the Scripture says what they want it to say rather than just saying what it says. I'll give you an example. I, I use this all the time. This is um, Jimmy and Donnie, the Swagger twins. This is what they said, and I've got a couple other things. This is the uh, Swaggart Expositor's Study Bible, written by the Swaggart brothers. They're not brothers. Donnie is Jimmy's son. Let me read to you 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 2, that you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, and then they have words in red. False doctrine does this. Neither by spirit. And then they have messages in tongues and interpretation which purport to be of the Lord, but really were not. Where did they get that? It says that you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit. And think of seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. That's what it means. I don't know where he came up with this messages in tongues and interpretation. By the way, the Swaggart boys speak in tongues, unknown tongues. Nor by word, nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. In red letters, in parentheses, should have been translated the day of the Lord. Because this is how the best manuscripts, West Cotton Hort, read. The day of the Lord refers to all events after the rapture. Do you see it? Do you see it? They have an ism, and the scriptures don't agree with their ism. So the ism makes them change the Bible. Edit the DNA. They've just, they've just notified you. We found, we found the gene in your Bible that is in error because it disagrees with our ism. Now, what we'd like to do is we have a, we have a CRISPR standing by. We would like to go into your, your DNA, your Bible, and we would like to edit that and fix it. Can we do that? And the church member goes, well, you're the doctor. I mean, you wouldn't tell me anything that would be, that would be harmful for me. You, would, you wouldn't do that. I mean, I trust you. You're the doctor. You see, I guarantee you, you could go into any, any Baptist church and stand up in front of those people and say, are you people against altering human DNA? Yes, amen, we're against that. Well, praise God, we don't want that. And the preacher then gets up and says, now you have uh, errors in your Bible that I'm going to correct for you. Amen, amen, correct them errors. Bless God. All our Bibles are wrong. Amen. Should have been translated the day of the Lord because this is how the best manuscripts, Westcott and Hort, Vatican, this is how the best Vatican manuscripts Read, the day of the Lord. Refers to all events after the rapture. Some were claiming, even in Paul's day, that the second coming was about to take place, which of course was wrong. Then the scriptures, and it's this is an amazing, this is an amazing piece of work here because there's like way more words in red letters and parentheses than there are actually scripture words. 
Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first. Here we go. The parentheses should have been translated for that day shall not come except there come a departure first. And everybody knows what that means. That's a plane leaving. A departure first. This speaks of the rapture, which in essence says the second coming cannot take place until certain things happen. So the ism, the ism says we believe the rapture occurs before anything else in the world ever. That's what the ism says. The King James Bible says that day our gathering together unto him cannot happen until there's a falling away first. Well, then, obviously, there's an error in the Bible, and we've got to change that error. So now it matches our ism. And I'm telling you, people, get out of the isms. Because as of now, in today's world, they are doing far more damage than any good that they would purport to do. All they sound like they have good intentions. We really just want to fully understand what God was really saying. Well, then with me, that's simple. Just open up King James Bible and start reading, and that's exactly what God said. Whether you understand it or not, that's what he said. And he's sticking by it. That's his story. And he's sticking to it. And there are rules that you cannot break concerning God's book. Now, I'm going to show you. This is why I believe that cloned individuals and these people that are going to have their adult DNA altered I'm going to show you from scriptures why I do not believe they will have eternal life. Let me show you. Where is it here? No, that's the Jesus with the joint. Hang on here. Let's look at this verse. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 2. You shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall you diminish aught from it. And that simply means, you know, to diminish something, don't you? Take it, take it away. Take stuff away. Um, Neither shall you diminish aught from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you. God said, don't add to it. So what did the, Jew, what did the Jews do? I mean, almost as soon as God said that, as soon as God said it, the Jewish leaders got together and said, now we're going we're gonna to add to this a little bit. We're going we're gonna to make sure that everybody follows the law and that nobody breaks the law and if you can't say God's name in vain then don't say it at all so they don't say God's name ever they never say it never say it and then they started adding all these traditions and all these rules and all these secondary ideas that you have to you have to do this if you oh Jesus did you see that did you see that they ate with unwashing hands I'm telling on them they did you see that Jesus said, I don't know what you're getting all bent out of shape for. You're not defiled by what goes into your body. You're defiled by what comes out of your body. And then he begins to list like 13 things that come out of the heart of man. I'm going to be talking about that and watching the video broadcast here before too long. But right here, God said, you, it, it was in the old covenant. The old covenant said, don't add to or take away. Deuteronomy 30, uh, 12, 32, whatsoever... What things soever I command you, observe to do it. Thou shalt not add to, add thereto, nor diminish from it. You cannot add or take away from God's word. You cannot do it in genetics. And by the way, you're saying, well, it's just like mice. Let me ask you a question. Who wrote mice? God did. Who wrote a tree's DNA? God did. Who wrote soybean DNA? God did. Who wrote corn DNA? God did. Who wrote, um, who wrote barley DNA? God did. Who wrote rice DNA? God did. So does Monsanto and DeKalb and these other seed companies, 
Do they have a right to change what God wrote? The answer is no. They have already violated Scripture, and I'm telling you, there is going to come a massive plague, probably from these seeds. These guys, they think they know what they're doing. They think they're the experts on everything, and I'm telling you, I guarantee you there's something they don't know and something they've overlooked, and I don't know what it is. If I knew what it is, I'd probably make a million dollars working for Monsanto, but I don't know what it is, and I guarantee you they're going to keep putting stuff out there until one of these days people are going to be walking around with plagues on them. Go read Revelation. Go read Leviticus 26. Go read, write this down, read Leviticus 26. There's a curse for those who add to or take away or diminish aught from God's word. You can't do it. So then he says, in the new covenant, new contract. By, by the way, again, this is simple contract law. A contract written between God and his people that said, no alterations to this contract will be in effect. They will be null and void. They'll be as if they never happened. No verbal, no verbal communication can ever nullify this contract, period. We're not going to add to it, not going to take away from it. God said it again, Jeremiah 26, 2, Thus saith the Lord, Stand in the court of the Lord's house, and speak unto all the cities of Judah, which come to worship in the Lord's house, all the words that I command thee to speak unto them. Diminish not a word. Preachers, you preach that whole book. You don't cherry pick the isms that you believe in and just preach on that. You preach that whole counsel of God. You preach Genesis like it was today. You preach Exodus like it was today. You preach Psalms like it was today. It's present truth. You preach that book. Don't diminish a word from preaching that book, preacher. If it says this, then you preach that. Fellow preachers, we are going to stand before Almighty God and give an account on how we handled his word. And if you handle it deceitfully, I've done it before. I've repented. I'm, I may do it again. I don't know. I don't think I'm done making all my stupid mistakes. I'll repent of them. Because i got to go stand before God and give an account of how I handled that book. Did I handle it deceitfully? Did I lie to people? Listen to the word of God, preachers. Revelation twenty two eighteen. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city. Well, I, I, I got saved. I got saved. That preacher told me I was I was seven years old. That that once I once I once I came to the altar, that's gonna be it. I could do anything I want to. Now I know some guys, I know some good men, I mean good men of God who believe in eternal life. I believe in eternal life, everlasting salvation, eternal redemption. I believe in that. I believe good ground Christians, once the seed is sown, they produce some 30, some 60, some 100 fold. I believe that. And they will tell you, no, we don't think that you can just go out and do whatever you want to. But I know some do. They teach it as if once you get down to the altar and you get up, you've prayed the prayer. You can go do whatever you want to, including you don't have to believe God anymore. I don't buy that. That's not biblical. It's not scriptural. It's wrong. And I want to tell you something. You, you're, you're, you're a danger to the pulpit of Jesus Christ. If you could convince me, and let's just be honest, those of you listening, let's just be honest. If you could convince me that all I have to do is pray a little prayer 
or get baptized in somebody's water and then go out and do whatever I want to do and I still go to heaven? If you can convince me of that, I'm out of here. I am. I've got so much wickedness in on the inside of me that I don't want to let out. It's all in there, people. And if you tell me that either like the Jehovah's Witness, I'll get a second chance after I, after I die. God's going to give me a second chance. I'm taking the second chance. I'm taking the second one. Every time I'm taking the second one. And Dave Bradley tells me that this guy told him, I'm, I'm so eternally secure, I can take the mark of the beast and still go to heaven. It sounds like to me he wasn't saved to begin with. With that attitude... That's not the spirit of Christ. That's not the spirit of holiness. That's not the spirit of his son crying, Abba, Father. That's not the Holy Spirit. You cannot add to nor take away from the words of DNA. I don't care if it's fish, grain, trees, bees, humans, monkeys. I don't care what it is. You cannot do that. God's fixing to pour out wrath on the genetic scientist who believe that they are better than God because God, obviously, there's mistakes. Are you listening to this? There's mistakes in DNA. There are. And we have figured out how to correct the mistakes. Now, Mr. Scientist, you probably don't want to hear this, but there have been preachers who are way better at this than you, and they've been doing it a lot longer than you, correcting the mistakes that are in the DNA. They've been doing this for thousands of years. Paul said, for we are not as many who corrupt the word of God. There was many, Mr. Scientist, there were many preachers who have been doing this for a long time. They're a lot better at it than you are. This is not some new revelation with them. This is how they, this is how they roll. Let me, let me read to you some more things here. This is from the Aramaic English New Testament. This is I explained this last week, and I talked about it Wednesday night. This is the English translation of the Greek translated into Aramaic and then retranslated into English. That's what this is. It is the thrice retranslated Bible that belongs, that was custom ordered by an ism. Hebrew roots ism. Sacred name ism. It was custom altered by the isms. I want to show you a couple things here. You're, you're going to be, and it didn't take me long either. I mean, this did not take me very long at all. Let me read Revelation 13. You know what Revelation 13 is? It's the identity of the Antichrist, the beast. I did a video called The um, Modern Translations in the Spirit of Antichrist because it, it dawned on me that all these Bibles were altering what the beast is going to look like. Why would they do that? It's like the police sending out an APB, an all points bulletin, or a BOLO, be on the lookout. Be on the lookout for a man six feet four inches tall, light brown hair, tall, thin build, approximately 40 to 45 years of age. He's wearing a black, black uh, uh, long sleeve shirt, white pants, and women's high heels. He's been seen in the vicinity of Main and First Street. Approach with extreme caution. He's ugly. So they put that out there. But the guy who put that out there, the bolo, and this guy's a bank robber. He put that out there because it was his buddy that robbed the bank. And the identity of the bank robber has now been altered. And now the police are looking for the wrong man. So here is in the, 
in the Greek to English to Aramaic to English translation. Here's what it says in Revelation 13. And he stood on the sand of the sea, and I... It's, it's so stupid. They changed... Um, what is it called? The person. It starts out, and he stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast. That's ignorant. Saw a beast of prey come up from the sea, having ten horns and seven heads, upon his horns ten diadems, and upon his heads names of blasphemy. And the beast of prey which I saw was like a leopard, and his feet like those of a wolf. Like those of a what? A wolf? Oh, well, we've got, hey, let's, sorry, sorry, what, what was your name again? Oh, Mr. Mr. Mac Belial, Mac Belial, because Mac means son of. Mac Belial, okay, um, sorry, Mr. Mac Belial, um, we, were, we got the wrong guy. We were told in the Be on the Lookout report for a guy walking around with bare feet. Uh, but you obviously don't have bare feet. You have uh, wolf's feet, and so we we we've got the we've got the wrong guy. Po apologize for that. Um, uh, oh, wow, that's an interesting mark you have on your right hand or forehead. Where did you get that? Uh, can we have can we have one of those? Oh yeah. Revelation chapter one, verse seven. Behold, he comes with clouds, and all eyes will see him, and also they who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn on account of him. Yes, amen. Verse eight. I am Aleph, also Tav, says the master yod heh vah Elohim, who is and was and is to come, the Omnipotent. I am the Aleph Tav. They changed the identity of the Savior, too. He's not the Alpha Omega, because that's the Greek language. That's the dirty language. Ah, I don't even like the thes. Dirty on my tongue. He's the Aleph Tav. Change the identity. 1 John chapter 5, verse 7. Get ready for this one. 1 John chapter 5, verse 6. This is he who came by the water and the blood, Yeshua the Mashiach. Not by the water only, but by the water and the blood. And the Spirit testifies because the Spirit is truth. And there were eight, in verse 8, there were three witnesses, the Spirit and the water and the blood, and these three are in union. Verse 7, here, here, here we go. You want to hear what they said? Uh, append, appended text, for there are three that testify in heaven, the Father, Word, and the Ruach HaKodesh, and these three are one, which is why Murdoch puts the brackets and adds, this verse is not wanting in most manuscripts and is omitted in the London 1826 edition. The fact is at this, that this line was inserted under the authority of Constantine to promote the Trinity doctrine. It does not exist in the Peshitta nor the oldest Greek manuscripts of Aleph, A, B, and the Vulgate. Vatican. Christo-paganism, which originated before Constantine taught that the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit are numerically three separate beings. The Hebrew roots people don't believe in the Godhead. They don't believe it. They're liars. All of them are liars. They don't believe in the Godhead. And so their ism made them omit and say these bad things about 1 John 5, 7, for there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. Of course they don't like it. that verse. It damns them. It condemns them. They believe in total opposition to the exact words of Scripture. So they didn't like it. And they had their CRISPR machine Cut it out. Take it away. Let's get back to Donnie and Jimmy, the Swagger twins. Hebrews chapter 2. You're going to have stuff fall off of your head when I read this to you. Hebrews chapter 2 by Jimmy and Donnie Swaggart. Hebrews 2 says, um, you made him a little lower than the angels. And then, of course, they stop right here. They can't let that one go. They say, should have been translated, 
You made him a little lower than the Godhead. That's not scripture. And here, let, me keep, let me keep reading. It should have been translated, you made him a little lower than the Godhead. The Hebrew word translated angels is Elohim, which means God, and should have been translated accordingly. So you don't have to believe that God made him lower than the angels. They took it out. The ism decided that it was wrong, so they took it out. I got one better than that one. That's just, that. you know what, that took me three minutes. It took me three minutes to open up their Bible. I'm t literally on every page of the Swaggart Expository Suppository Bible. On every page is Bible correction. The Swaggarts don't just believe there are a few minor errors in the King James Bible. They believe that there's a ton of them everywhere. And God has given them special light and special glasses like Joe Smith to be able to find all of those quote-unquote errors in the Scriptures. They don't even make it past the first two verses of Genesis before they start correcting the Word of God. Let me show you what Jimmy and Donnie, the Swaggart boys, say. In the beginning, God, and um, there's all kinds of red stuff in here. I'm just not taking the time to read it. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Then stop right here. Could be translated the heavens and the earth because God created the entirety of the universe. You are so ignorant, swaggerts. You just make it say whatever you want to say and what you already believe, that's what you do. Don't you dare, don't you dare change your opinion on something just because a Bible verse contradicts it. You're going to dig your heels in. You're going to keep believing what you believe regardless of what the Bible says. And you're going to change it. Those poor, ignorant King James translators sitting around, sucking their thumbs, drinking coffee, don't know what they're doing, but you do. I'm not done. Verse 2. You know where I'm going, don't you? And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. Stop right here. Red letters say, God did not originally create the earth without form and void. It became this way. After a cataclysmic happening, this happening was the revolt of Lucifer against God, which took place sometime in the dateless past. Three earths. Larkin says the same thing. Larkin's book of truth all throughout teaches and and if if you got a copy open it up actually you can download a pdf there's several of them online you can download a pdf do a search and every place where the king james bible says and the earth was without form and void Larkin changes it because he doesn't like it, doesn't say what he wants it to say. And he keeps saying over and over and over, the earth became formless and void. It became void and without form. It became void, not was void. He didn't like what the King James Bible said in countless places. And he replaced it either with his own understanding, or the revised version, because he didn't like what it said. So he decided to be a genetic scientist. I guess I get rid of that graphic here. He decided to become a genetic scientist and alter 
the genetic structure of the Word of God because it disagreed with his ism. And I would suggest to some people, if you're really looking for the truth, don't read the books. Don't go to the seminars. Don't listen to the doctors who teach the isms. Listen to the Holy Spirit for a change. Listen to the unaltered, incorruptible Word of God. Listen to that one. If you're really hungering for truth, you'll find it if you'll seek it with all your heart, the Bible says. But because you've been established in an ism, and whatever the ism says, that's what you believe. I would encourage you to set aside the ism just for a moment and read the Word of God, the King James Bible, without someone telling you it doesn't really mean that. It should have been, it should have been translated a different way. Or you can't really read that and add it to your doctrine because that's not supposed to be for your doctrine. That's what isms do. Isms force people to not believe the Word of God and to accept as doctrine things that God never said. Open your Bibles to Ezekiel 13. I'm going to show you what this, now, I'm going to, I, let's see if I have that up there. Let me pull up. I don't know if I put that verse down or not. I was going to tell you why I believe, yeah, here we go. I was going to tell you why I believe that these people with this altered DNA, they, I want to tell you why I believe that they will not have eternal life. Let me tell you why I believe it. Acts chapter 7, verse 48. How be it the Most High dwelleth not in temples made with what? hands. As saith the prophet, heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. What house will you build me, saith the Lord? Or what is the place of my rest? Hath not my hand made all these things? Acts chapter 17. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are too superstitious. For as I passed by and behold, beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. Neither is worshipped with men's hands, as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things. You know what all things is? I think all things is the word of God. But God, twice now in your Bible, it tells you that God does not dwell in a temple made with hands. The body's the temple. And these genetic scientists are altering the body, which is the temple. They are, think of what Masons do. What do Masons do? Masons build with stones. And if, and if you look at some of the Masonic books, they talk about the, Masonic's, the, the Mason's tools, his work tools, which is the hammer and the chisel. You know why? Because they get these stones, and these stones aren't right. These stones are, are not good. They've got errors all over it. It's going to take me, my work of my hands, to make this the smooth ashlar in Freemasonry. Now we can build the pyramid with it. Go look on the back of your dollar bill. They didn't just grab quarry rock and put mortar on it and set it up there for that pyramid. No, 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 no. They did it with men's hands. Now, a genetically altered human being, I believe God will not dwell in that temple, in that tabernacle. I don't think he will. I think men's hands have rebuilt that temple. Are you getting this?
Think about a church, which is a body of believers. And in that body of believers, you have people bringing in the DNA of that body, the Word of God. And they bring that DNA in, and their pastor who's been to seminary, and he's got a doctorate degree, and he's really smart because we, he's, and some of you pastors out there, take that name doctor and wad it up and throw it away. I was, and I'm not, I'm not upset. I was offered a doctorate degree, an honorary doctorate. And I told the, the gentleman, the brother, dear brother in the Lord, good friend of mine, it's, that's not me. It's not me. Most of the people that follow me specifically do so because I'm not a doctor. They've heard from the doctors, and the doctors all told them, you have errors in your DNA. And I've been to Bible college, and I've read, uh, I've got a concordance in my office that I use. And I can tell you, you've got errors in your, in your Bible, and I'm going to correct them for you. We're going to re- that, that Bible is wrong, and I'm going to correct it. That's a temple made with hands. God said he wouldn't dwell in it. Ezekiel chapter 13, here's how they put it together. In Ezekiel, I guess I ought to turn there, shouldn't I? Ezekiel chapter 13. They took these stones, and they built something with what God called untempered mortar. Now, I had to look that word up. I know what tempered, I know when you have tempered glass, that means it's been hardened by fire. When you have tempered steel, it's been, it's been altered, it's been hardened by fire, okay? In this case, the word temper means to, it's mixed right, Go to etymologyonline.com, I think it's dot .com, and type in the word untempered, and it will give you, in fact, let me see if I still have it up here. Uh, no, I can't, let me pull it up here. Let me pull up, show you what I'm talking about here. Etymology, here we go, right there, here we go. All right, let me put that over here. So you can see it, and then I'll do this, and we'll do that. I like etymology because, yeah, I already have it there, untempered. Untempered. I like etymology because I like to find out where our words in English come from. That's really interesting. Untempered, mid-15th century, not properly mixed, undiluted. Similar formation in Middle Dutch, ungetempered. John, how, how is my, how's my Dutch? Ungetempered. Middle High German, um, ungetempert, earlier as unrestrained, but it's not properly mixed. It's not properly bonded together. Mortar is cement. So watch this now. It had something mixed in it. that made the mortar not stick. So let's read, let's take that and read Ezekiel 13. Uh, Let's see here, verse 9. Now let's go back up. Let's get, let's walk circumspectly around this. Let's go to verse 7. Have you not seen a vain vision and have you not spoken a lying divination? Whereas you say the Lord saith it, I'll be, I have not spoken. So Donnie says, now, what God really would have said, he really would have said, this is a departing as in the rapture. That's what God really should have said. And God said, I didn't say that. I want, I want you to take a look at this. I want to show you this. I want to show you what it looks like. See all those red letters there? Let me see if I can get it to hold still here. Okay. See all those red letters there? Every bit of that is, God did not say this. Those red letters 
are mixtures in the mortar that causes the mortar to be untempered. God never said those words. You want to study the Bible? Study the Bible. Just study the Bible. What's wrong with that? Because I got people telling me on this side, oh, you got to have the Hebrew and the Greek, and you, you don't know the Hebrew and Greek, and you got to, and if you don't know it, then you need to let these people tell you what it means. And then I got these people over here saying, no, 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 you've got to read our books and you've got to apply our methodology when you read that book. You've got to do it this way or you're not going to be right. And then I'm standing here telling you, you know what, just open it up and read it. Why not? What's wrong with that? What's wrong with just letting people open that Bible up and read it and believe what it says? What's wrong with that? What are you afraid of? God said, I didn't say it. There, verse 8, Therefore thus saith the Lord God, because ye have spoken vanity and seen lies, therefore behold, I am against you, saith the Lord. These things masquerade as Bibles. It says, New Testament. That is sheep's clothing. It looks like a sheep on the outside, but inwardly it's a ravening wolf. So verse 9, And my hand shall be upon the prophets that see vanity and that divine lies. They shall not be in the assembly of my people. You know what that means? God says they're not saved. They shall not be in the assembly of my people, neither shall they be written in the writing of the house of Israel. Their names will not be written in the Lamb's book of life, slain from the foundation of the world. Neither shall they enter into the land of Israel, and ye shall know that I am the Lord God. Because even because they have seduced my people, remember the seducing spirits, saying peace, and there was no peace. And one built up a wall, and lo, others daubed it with untempered mortar. Do you know what a wall represents in the King James Bible? Salvation. God has appointed uh, walls for salvation. A wall is what keeps and protects. So here we're looking at the doctrine of salvation. One built up a wall, um, and, and lo, others daubed it with untempered mortar, meaning that they added things to the cement to hold the stones together that won't work. It will look good at the first, but because the mortar is untempered, it will not hold, it won't last, it won't stand, it will fall. Verse 11, say unto them which daub it with untempered mortar, that it shall fall. I wonder what Donnie would have to say there. Now, a better translation, really, this really means they'll be raptured. There shall be an overflowing shower, and ye, O great hailstones, shall fall, and stormy wind shall rend it. Hold that place there and go to Revelations. Some people say it's, I go to Revelations. Revelations chapter 8. I want you to look and see what happens here. Um, let's... Um, Verse, the first angel sounded, verse 7, and there followed hail and fire mingled with blood, and they were cast upon the earth, and the third part of the trees was burnt up, and all green grass was burnt up. So you have this hail storm taking place, and you know what it's doing? It's discovering the foundations. Here's this wall of salvation, quote unquote, that they built for you, and they added words into the mortar. They added things that God didn't say. They added that to the mortar, the very thing that's supposed to hold it up. It's not going to work. So he said, um, 
The stormy wind shall rend it. Well, lo, verse 12, when the wall is fallen, shall it not be said unto you, where is the daubing where, wherewith ye have daubed it? Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, I will even rend it with a stormy wind in my fury, and there shall be an overflowing shower in mine anger. There's a storm coming, people. And great hailstones in my fury to consume it. So will I break down the wall that you have daubed with untempered mortar and bring it down to the ground so that the foundation thereof shall be discovered and it shall fall. I have discovered the foundation of an ism. And when I share it publicly, it's going to make a lot of of people very angry at me when I show it because they have decided that they're going to defend their ism against uh, against all enemies foreign and domestic and what's what's going to happen is God I'm not saying he's going to do it when I say it. God, at, at some point in your life, you build up a wall of your own way of salvation. And you know what you've done? You've added things to the Word of God that God never said. And at some point, a storm's going to come. And it's going to beat down that wall. And the foundation of your lies are going to be discovered. Hopefully, God will do that to you so that you can see that you have fashioned your whole life on lies all of this time. Never decided to change your mind in anything. When the Bible said something different than what you decided it should say, you just went along with what everybody else did. All that, now the original Greek says this, and now the original Hebrew says this, and and uh, oh, that's uh, you. You just kind of take that out, put it to the side because that that doesn't really pertain to us, and that's what you do. So God says, thus will I accomplish my wrath upon the wall and upon them that have daubed it with untempered mortar and will say unto you, the wall is no more, neither that ye, neither they that daubed it. To wit, the prophets of Israel, which prophesy concerning Jerusalem, which see visions of peace for her, and there is no peace, saith the Lord. Turn to um, Exodus 22. Exodus 22. It's the two places in the Bible where God talks about untempered mortar. Uh, let's see here. Where is it? Exodus 22. It is. Here we go. Look in verse. Um, let's start in verse 20. Let's make a big circle around it. As they gather silver and brass and iron and lead and tin in the midst of the furnace to blow the fire upon it, to melt it, so will I gather you in mine anger and in my fury, and I will leave you there and melt you. You know what God's doing? You know what God will do to you and for you? He'll run you through the fire to clean out the dross. Somebody, somebody say amen to that one. That's, what, that's me. He said, Yea, I will gather you and blow upon you in the fire of my wrath, and you shall be melted in the midst thereof. As silver is melted in the midst of the furnace, so shall ye be melted in the midst thereof, and ye shall know that I, the Lord, have poured out my fury upon you. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, say unto her, Thou art the land that is not cleansed nor rained upon in the day of indignation. There is a conspiracy of her prophets. You think about it. I'm not... Who can you trust? Who can you trust? Whose confidence are you putting your beliefs in? And I've been to these meetings where they, I mean, it's just nonstop men praising. Oh, Dr. So-and-so, he's, oh, he's, I mean, I just love, this man says it and I believe it. And Brother So-and-so, he's preached it this way for all this time. And he's the, and I've been in those services and I just, I'm just going, God, my spirit does not rest with this kind of preaching. 
And I'm just asking you, who do you trust? And don't say Mike Hoggard. Don't. Number one, you'll get me in trouble. Number two, God, I'll say something stupid one of these days, and it'll hurt you. You just take everything I say with a grain of salt, and you say, God, I've never heard that before. If it's right, you show it to me independent of Pastor Mike in the Bible, and then I'll know that it's from you because it's in the Word of God. But then if, you, if I say something and you're going, wow, that's like some new thing, and oh boy, but if it's not in the Word of God, you run. And that goes to every doctor and every exalted minister. Who do you trust? There were people who trusted Jack Scop. There were people who trusted Jack Hiles. There were people who trusted Jerry Falwell. There were people who trusted Billy Graham. Untempered mortar. So anyway, there's a conspiracy of her prophets in the midst thereof, like a roaring lion ravening the prey. There you go. Does that ring a bell, roaring lion? So add that, add that to be sober, be vigilant, for your adversary the devil as a roaring lion walketh to and fro, seeking whom he may devour, whom resists steadfast in the faith. The ravening lion, the roaring lion, there is a conspiracy amongst the ism preachers. And that's where the roaring lion is. And they have put no difference between the holy and profane. Neither have they showed difference between the unclean and clean and have hid their eyes from my Sabbath and I am profaned among them. Her princes in the midst thereof are like ravening wolves. Wolves ravening the prey to shed blood and destroy souls and to get honest gain, dishonest gain. And her prophets have daubed them with untempered mortar, seeing vanity and divining lies unto them, saying, The Lord, thus saith the Lord God, when the Lord hath not spoken. That is, now, it, the, the earth was made form and void. That's what that is. And that is not what. God said, God said the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light, and God saw that the light was good. That's the Word of God. But this nonsense about, well, you know, it's actually the Hebrew gives the idea, well, it was, you know, it became that way because... Because our ism says that there was like, I don't know, there was a earth way back then. And God said, don't look at me. I never said that. He never said it. But the prophets told you that that's what you had to believe. God said, that day shall not come except there come a falling away first. But the prophets conspired and said, it doesn't really say that. Really, re what it really should be is a, a, a departing, and that's the rapture. See, so now our ism is still right. That's like Virginia um, Malin, Mal Malincott, Virginia Malincott, the militant masculine lesbian whose claim to fame is, according to her website, she sat on the translating committee of the NIV saying things that God did not say. i got a couple minutes left here. I'm going to check out some emails just to see what everybody says. Bill says, I gave give all my praise to the Lord God Almighty. Amen. Appreciate that. Patty K. says, God is the creator. This Frankenstein mishmash of various men's DNA is Satan's attempt at creating life. Could it be that fallen angels will inhabit these beings, hence no soul from God? That's exactly what I believe. 
I believe that it's Babylon the Great, and Babylon is the cage of every foul and hateful bird. Habitation of devils. Joe says, which version of the KJV is the right version? Are you saying that we have to use King James Bible from 1611, a more updated version? Which King James should I use? Joe, um, I don't know if you're being... Um, I'm going to assume that you're asking a le legitimately. In other words, you're not just trying to trip me up. Joe, I I'll do this if you want. I, I don't have time. If I had it right here, I'd do it in a heartbeat. Hang on, let me look. I have a 1611 reprint, and I guarantee you I could bring it out and read it word for word to you, and you would not be able to tell the difference between the 1611 and the 1729 King James Bible, the one we have right now. The American Bible Society did a survey in the 1850s, the 1850s, because the issue came up. Some were saying that the King James Bible they had in 1850 was not like the original in 1611. The American Bible Society researched that topic for months. They wrote the report back and said that the Bible that we have now in 1850 is the same one from 1611. The only difference was differences in spelling and, and uh, publication errors, and they listed examples. And you could clearly see that it was a publishing error. There is, I believe, the King James Bible. It's the same yesterday, today, and forever. It's the same one. I hope that answers your question. And if you're trying to, if you're saying that to trip me up, because I don't know who you are, if you're saying that to try to trip me up, I believed the other way on this thing. I heard that same argument. And what I'm going to suggest to you, Joe, is that you personally have never examined a 1611 King James Bible verse by verse with a current King James Bible. You've never done it. You believed what you were told to believe from an ism. But you never, you never looked at it yourself. I challenge you to do it. Bruce, dear pastor, Isaiah 15, woe unto them that seek deep to hide their counsel from the Lord and their works are in the dark. And they say, who seeth us and who knoweth us? Surely your turning of things upside down shall be esteemed as the potter's clay for, uh, for, uh, for shall the work say of him that made it, he made me not, or shall the thing framed say of him that framed it, he had no understanding. That's exact. I, I, uh, Bruce, dead on, man. I get it. The thing that was created does not tell the creator, hey, God, you got some things wrong. Neither does the guy who wants to be saved by the Bible tell the God who wrote the Bible, um, I think there's some errors in here. Because um, I was told that there were three earths, and I don't see it in here anywhere. So obviously you got some... There's, there's some things you got wrong. Don't God, don't worry. Don't come down here. We'll fix it ourselves. That's what they say. Um, Joe, if you want, I can't do it Thursday because I'm going to be on the road Thursday. 1611 King James Bible, same one. Same one. That issue had been settled long before you and I were ever born. But I appreciate you bringing it up anyway. It just seemed like something fun to talk about, all right? Uh, Alan says, uh, Pastor Mike, I did trust you until the Vegemite stuff. Because <laughs> everybody that visits here at Bethel, I make them take a dose of Vegemite. I just lost the whole continent of Australia. God bless you. I love you. Pray for us. We'll be in church tomorrow night.